I'd like to greet you all, saints, in the wonderful name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Great to be speaking to you once again. It is the 15th of September 2021. We are on Demonology 2021, Part 21, and God of this Evil Age, Part 4. Today we want to speak from a, a segment of this message, God of this Evil Age, that the prophet gets into, which is science and progress. Or progress, whichever way you want to say it. Scripture reading will begin from Genesis chapter 4 verse 2 and also verse 16 to 22. And the word of God reads like this. And she again bare his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. That's verse 2. Verse 16 to verse 22. And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod. On the east of Eden, and Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bare Enoch. And he builded a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. And unto Enoch was born Irad, and Irad begat Mehujael, and Mehujael begat Methusael, and Methusael begat Lamech. And Lamech took unto him two wives. The name of the one was Ada, and the name of the other Zillah. And Ada bare Jabel. He was the father of such as dwell in tents, and of such as have cattle. And his brother's name is Jubal. He was the father of all that such as handle the harp and the organ. And Zillah, all, she also bare Tubalcain, an instructor of every artificer in brass and iron. And the sister of Tubalcain was Naamah. Amen. The Lord had a blessing to his word. Now, this is such an important part of demonology today that we just cannot ignore, which is the advancement of science and the progress of man. In all our sessions of demonology, this has been the elephant in the room. The major advancements of technology and the flooding of the fifth dimension, hell, into the fourth dimension, the realm of communication through the ether. In other words, all the power of the enemy, demon spirits, devil spirits being poured into your realm of communication, of science, of technology. You know, we've been speaking about spiritual things. When we started demonology, we started with uh, the physical realm. We started with sickness. We spoke about the senses. We spoke about things, you know, affecting us on the outside. We spoke about many things, uh, different things. We, we went to enticing spirits. We spoke about spiritual situations in the church, characters of man. We spoke about lies and the effect of lies. We, we spoke about how everything begins with a lie. We did so many of these things. And yet we know when I, when I say it's the elephant in the room, in today's world, if you had to collectively or give a collective name to that which is bringing society down it is without a doubt science and man's advancements in technology for most believers we have given up vices like alcohol drugs smoking and other subtle addictions but our lives and time have been overwhelmed with this phenomenon that is called technology, internet, social media, smart devices, and busy, busy, busy lives trying to make more technology and make life easier and easier. Right? This is what we do every single year. Isn't it amazing? We are working so hard to make life easier all the time. When will we ever be finished? When will we ever be satisfied that life has been made easy? Now we can all sit back and enjoy what we've made that has brought life to this easy place where we are at. It just doesn't seem possible. It seems like there's some other kind of addiction we have that, that keeps us going on, plodding every day, just trying to make our life easier all the time. We've got to buy something new to make this part of life easier. We gotta buy something else new to make this part of our life easier. Some new appliance, some new software, some new this, some new that. And it's just like it's never ending. Once we found something else that made this part of life easier, then we gotta look for another part of life that needs to be easier. It's an unending cycle. 
The reality is, we have all been trapped by this part of demonology and we are barely keeping our heads above water, saints. That's the part that we don't recognize, is that we are drowning. We're like somebody floating in a, in a lake or in, an, in the ocean and we have no life jacket and all we have is the strength to swim for a little bit before our energy runs out. And we're trying, we reach a stage where all we can do is keep our noses above water so we can breathe in the last few breaths of air. We, that's where we are with science and technology. What you have to see is that the more advancement of science we see believers replacing the word of God with, the more the church will move away from needing God and depending on him. And that's exactly what demonology wants to do with us. Get us away from depending on God. Get us away from relying on Him. Get us away from thinking about Him more often than we should be. Let's begin with this quote in God of this Evil Age, paragraph 89. Prophet says, Now let's watch it be manifested. He says he's making a better world for them to live in, by his knowledge, apart from the never failing word of God. Right? So that's what the enemy is doing through man. Man is saying he's making a better world for us to live in. Right? By our knowledge. And they're actually, what they're saying is, we don't need to live by the word of God. We've got things working for us. You know, I, I've actually spoken to you about this before. It says, but, so the enemy, Satan, but by his coming together in denominations and creeds and intellectual and scientific and so forth, he's making a better world for man to live in and ignoring the promise of God that the only time the world will be fit to live in is in the millennium. You know, my opinion, he's made a better world to sin in instead of live in. Notice, did he do it? He legalized sin. Oh, saints, I don't, you know, where do we start? Notice Satan's coming together. Right? Watch what he says. Satan, he's coming together in denomination. So what this meant is the joining of denominationalism with the education of the world, with scientific advancements, they're all aligning. Right? At one time... Religion and scientific advancements were never aligned. Religion and education of the world was never aligned. They found themselves to be enemies. Now, we have the greatest scientists among the churches. We have the greatest scientists amongst, or the, the greatest educated professors and, and things like that, aligning themselves with, with religion. It's incredible. We've never had a time like this before. The enemy has infiltrated every interest of man, every part of man's world, religion, entertainment, education. It's, he's infiltrated every part. And he's deceived man by it, by the infiltration that has come in. He's made, in other words, let me put it this way. It's not in my notes, but I'll just say it this way. He's taken religion and said, let me make it sweeter for you. Let me make religion more advanced. Let me make your worship with God more beautiful, more entertaining, more wonderful. Let me make it sound better. Let me make you enjoy it more. See, entertainment. He had to pick entertainment up to a higher level. Let's make entertainment greater. Let's make more of it. Let's, let's. Make so much of it you can't get enough. Let's put it out there so that wherever you want to look, you're being entertained. How about education? Let's make education more enjoyable for you. Let's make it, uh, um, you know, something that everyone can benefit from. Everyone can have education. And, and, and everyone has free schools and we can give them free school, free education, free textbooks. That's how it all started. And don't worry. It's all going to be fantastic, but what did they slip into the education? Education, Disbelief in God. Um, teaching you to hate your faith. 
dividing you in your spirit, right? By trying to make it more beautiful, more acceptable, demonology has come in in full force and deceived man by it. He has deceived man into following the way of sin through man's own interests. That's all he had to do. Take your interest. That means like he has flooded the internet with all your interests. Listen, anything you want to do is there available and there's ways to make it better. It's, it, there's ways to make you better at your own interests. Now just think about that. If you had to Google something that you're interested in, right? There was once a time you'd go to a library and try to find a book. You'd probably find one book on something you're into. How to make a wooden cupboard. You find one book, you'll take it home, you'll work on it, you'll make the stuff. Now you're going to spend a whole week going through every single website, every single picture, until you find what you're looking for. And by the time you find what you're looking for, you found a thousand other things that's, make you, that's made you interested in. Right? You find things you never even knew you were interested in. But now suddenly, after one week of looking of just how to make a wooden cupboard, wow, you found a thousand things to be interested in. Now you're occupied for the rest of the year. And what's happening with that, uh, being occupied with, you're losing interest in the things that are important to you. Family life. The word of God, your prayer life, the tool that he uses to get into every interest is always science, technology, right? Remember God told man that the ground would be cursed, that he would have to work by the sweat of his brow to eat bread? Well, by science, demonology has influenced man to become more productive, to overcome the curse and make life more pleasurable. Right? So you don't have to go out into the world with your bone arrow and spend six hours hunting something. And then once you catch it, two hours dragging it back home, protecting it from enemies and other animals. And then another four hours skinning that beast, taking the skin off, drying it to use it for leather, and um, cutting the meat up, making the beast bleed till all the blood runs out so we can, you can eat it. Then uh, cutting all the meat up, salting it to preserve it for as long as you can, dividing it up, sharing it with other people, that's a whole day's work just to hunt one animal. No, you don't have to do that. We've become productive. We've got somebody doing the farming for us. Thousands of heads of beef or heads of, uh, of cattle. Thousands. And then we've got another. We were so productive. We've got the abattoirs where they will take them, slaughter them for us. And then we've got the factories that package the meat, cut them all up for us neatly. We're so productive. Then we've got the place where the abattoirs would sell to the butcheries. The butcheries will sell to the public. All we have to do is just keep paying our taxes, be more productive, and we can go to the stores and buy neatly packaged meat. We're saving time, aren't we? We don't have to actually go out in the world and be fit be healthy, go hunt an animal, get out into the open, experience the fauna and flora, be a part of the forest and the grasslands. We don't have to get resistance to pollens and grasses and trees and we don't have to touch anything icky and, you know, uh, see weird little creatures and we don't have to get in touch with the earth. We don't have to. We're so productive we just sit at our, at our homes and whenever we feel like having a steak, we just go to the store and buy that steak. That's how productive we've become. Life is so much more pleasurable, right? What happens? Man has become so productive, so intelligent, and has developed an all-powerful complex. 
That means he feels all powerful. It's so bad that he feels he can do anything and deal with whatever consequences arise. That arrogance is causing man to lose control faster than he could ever imagine. Right? It's so bad, he doesn't even realize how out of control the world is, how out of control his life is. Becoming more productive. Let's have a look at what that does. Now, firstly, being productive means to produce something quicker and more efficiently and very large quantities. In terms of an individual, if your boss tells you you need to be more productive and you're an office worker who works behind a computer, it means you need to get more work done with the time you have available. That's what more productive means. Get more work done with less time. So you have more time to do other things. Right. What other things? So what is the problem with that, you say? There's big problems with that. The problem with this is that there is no end to finding ways to improve. Just look at every single company. Every single year, they have a special section of that company finding ways to be more productive. Right? Just ask the people in our churches who are in the corporate world. They, are, they pay people. They pay a large group of people just to find ways to be more productive. Right? It consumes our time our energy, trying to be more productive. It distracts us from our families. Your wife will tell you, just leave the computer, just leave the PC, just come on, let's go, let's go have some fun with the kids outside. Just, just, just one more thing. Just one more, I just got to finish this thing here and then I'll be set for the week. (laughs) Right, we all know how that goes. You'll be sitting for the week. Right? It distracts us from our families and our spiritual purpose. Becoming more productive in the ways of the world also needs more tending to things. Right? So, remember, as nice as it sounds that you're becoming more productive, you're you're making more things to make more things to make other things so that life eventually down the line is easier. But, to get life easier then, there's so much to maintain to make sure life gets easier. And what do we do? We seem to be trapped in this idea that we should be so satisfied that we got a great solution down the line. We made life so much easier by getting the the cycle of doing easy things to get uh, an outcome that makes life easier. But what we don't realize is we have to manage that easy system. And that's what takes our time away. Our reward, you say, well, once it's done, our plan has succeeded. Pat all of ourselves on the back. Our plan has succeeded. Wasn't that a great plan? It's working. It's a fantastic plan. Well done, you. Well done, you. Well done, me. We feel great. How much time did we spend on this plan? A whole year. How much time did you lose with your teenage son? A whole year. Right? When is it ever going to free up? And guess what's happening next year? We need to improve last year's plan. It's supposed to free up your time to get other things done. But does it really? Even when you go on holiday with the family, you're still wondering how you can make life easier when you get back. You don't even switch off the phones. You don't even switch off the technology and just enjoy the mountain air where you chose to go to or the the seaside where you chose to relax. No, you still need to be planning on how to make life easier. Even the holiday. You're so addicted to progress and being productive. Holiday has got to be get up in the morning. Seven o'clock, the sun's the sun. We wake up with the sun at seven o'clock. We're at the first venue. We've got to see there. Let's take our selfie with that. Let's see this monument there, and let's take our selfie with that. Tick that off the list. Then we move to the next one. Catch the next bus. We're going to the next venue in two hours' time. Uh, let's get a snack on the way. And by the time you're you're at the end of the day, 
You're tired. The kids are tired. But you've ticked everything off your list. You, you sit back at the hotel room uh, where you had your holiday and you're thinking, wow, we were so productive on this holiday. Aren't we the greatest? It's incredible. You spent most of the time looking at the world through your phone, through the lens of a camera. You missed the smells, you missed the tastes, you missed the beautiful part of what you intended to do. But don't worry, your Facebook friends are so proud of you. Your Instagram friends are so proud of you because of where you went to and what they see that you did there. You go, you're awesome. And your children, well, the way you had to bustle them, rush them, get them going here, get them going, dress for this part, smile for this photograph and all of that, they're becoming neurotic just like you. An insufferable person just like you who just can't relax, who just can't enjoy one hour in the sunshine doing nothing, thinking about nothing, but just being there with your family, having a casual conversation, not worrying about what time it is, which bus to catch, which venue to get to next. Go to a bird park and just sit there and watch one bird and take in so much on what... No, we've got to finish all the birds because that's what we came here to do. <laughs> it's incredible what we've become saints. We've, we've become a, a, a really... Sorry bunch of people in society that, you know, you miss so much in your, in your own home, your own yard, you, the area that you live in. You don't, even, you don't even realize how much of God's creation you're missing out on. And so we plod on with this life. We're just excited that we're so much more productive than we were last year. And we're going to feel the same next year. We got so much done. Well, it's supposed to free up your time, right? But you'll find, ask any one of you if you have time for something else. Ah, too busy. How are you doing? Oh, we're doing fine. But wow, just busy. No time for anything else. When are you ever going to get time? In the message, God of the Civil Age, paragraph 94 Here's a stunning quote too. Brother Branham says, Notice, it's noteworthy to notice. At the beginning, Seth and his children never went the scientific way. Now we're going to talk about science for a few minutes. If I say this, not excusing my ignorance, but a bunch of ignoramuses, anything that'll deny the word of God. See, sure, it's noteworthy. Watch it. Seth's children never went the scientific route. And what's he doing is bringing a comparison. They were humble herdsmen and farmers and so forth. But Cain's children did. Why? Inspired by their daddy the devil. Cain inspired by his daddy the devil. And these inspired by that seed coming down. Watch the seed of God coming down through, the, through every age, the prophet says. Watch where it's heading up today. Christians, genuine Christians, are not all about scientific research and stuff. No. Just a minute, we'll get into that. So... If you look at Genesis 4 and 2 and 16 and 22, the scripture that we read at the beginning, it tells you what uh, the seed of, uh, um, of Adam were doing, right? And, and then verse 16 to 22 tells you what Cain's lineage was doing. Cain's lineage was interested in, in science, technology, progress in man's advancement. They were all about building cities making stuff out of iron and steel or whatever materials they got at the time. They were making musical instruments. What are we looking at? Science, technology, music and art, building of cities, education. While Seth's lineage was simple people, content to live in peace with the earth and live as God intended. It was man's advancement in science and technology at that time. Science, technology, entertainment that led to the first destruction in the flood. We have a scripture that tells us that, as it was in the days of Noah. So what do we expect in a time like this, saints? I mean, it's, it's not difficult for us to see, right? 
Let's get to another point. God of this evil age. Let's have a look at Satan's gospel. Paragraph 96. Now we know that Satan's gospel is a gospel of science and progress. He preached it in Eden, not God. Right? He preached progress. Satan did the science of progress. Science and progress is Satan's gospel. Look where he's led us today with it. You know, now, if we tell this to people on the outside, they'll think, wow, these people are really batty. You know, these, are, these people are drinking something uh, because, you know, Satan's gospel, really? Science and progress? Man, you guys have smartphones, you've got beautiful cars, and you coming and telling us Satan's gospel is science and progress, you bunch of hypocrites. Look, that's what they'll say to us, Okay. The prophet says, science and progress is Satan's gospel. Look where he's led us to today with it. See, so we need to do that. Now, this is important to understand. We are not saying that the true gospel of Christ is backward, foolish, ignorant something. Not at all. Listen, being smart and intelligent is something God created man to be. No doubt. So the ability to teach the word, to search for the truth, to have the ability to express it in wonderful ways to the people, is just beautiful, and God loves that. But the word has to be the attraction, not the medium. If you're preaching in church with technology and science and the brilliance of some man, and you have, you know, the screen and beautiful PowerPoint presentation, and it's all about the presentation and the animation and, and how much attraction there is in it, you can do all that. You can fill up a whole hour with beautiful technology. But if you don't have enough word in there, that's a problem. That's something God does not take lightly. What he is saying here is that Satan's good tidings or good news to man. That's gospel. Gospel means good tidings or good news. Satan's good news, Satan's good tidings to man is one of science and progress. And the science of progress. That is... He introduces more knowledge in everything, everything, to make life progress into something that looks better than yesterday. Wow, that makes us feel great. If, he, if tomorrow is better than yesterday, that makes us feel wonderful, isn't it? In other words, demonology has a way of attracting people to it by the attraction of advancements and progress of men. This is important, right? Believe me, it works. If you get two preachers on the, on the pulpit and you've got the one guy who is, you know, he's just rugged. He's just preaching there with his old beat up Bible and walking around and he's got something to say in maybe, you know, an hour and a half. And he really takes it, the word of God and breaks it down and he's... But then you've got this other guy who's just really smart, intellectual, full of technology. He's got this gadget and that gadget and, you know, uh, uh, and he preaches 45 minutes, a real polished up something. And he's got fact figures and scientific words and all of that stuff. And he puts it all together in 45 minutes and the people come out, wow, that was amazing. This guy is really good. That's what they're going to say. This guy is really good. And the way he put it together for us, you know, with the technology, it was really fascinating. All the pictures and diagrams. Now, you know, I love pictures and diagrams. I love teaching the Word of God with, you know, visual aids. And I love that, really. But I'm the most comfortable with the chalkboard. I love a chalkboard. And it's just friendly with me. And uh, I could, if you give me a, a chalkboard or a whiteboard somewhere, I can teach anything, anywhere, anytime. The whole night, the whole day, I'm comfortable with that. Uh, but, you know, if I could get, you know, more uh, um, advanced in technology, I would be able to use it. And if it's quicker and if it's easy to carry to some places, yes, I would by, by all means use it. But I'm not going to let the advancements overpower what content I should have. I'm not going to let the advancements overpower the word that I'm bringing out. Right? I don't need to disguise what I'm saying with technology. But believe me, with people, it works. You can totally fool people. 
Most people today would rather go to church, to a church that is beautifully air conditioned, have smart screens everywhere, coffee shops, childcare while you sit in church, rather than sit in some crude hall with no luxuries and listen hungrily to the word. Why? Why is it demonology? Just take those people out of their comfortable environment and they cannot accept the word. Isn't it incredible? They can't accept, the, you know, this church is not for me. It's a little bit too uncomfortable. The people are too squashed together. You know, um, there's a lot of smells there that I don't really like, you know. And maybe in this little building, it's a little bit too noisy. They shout too much. Maybe, oh, they sing too loud. The music is too loud. Something, something to that effect. You know, you take you out of your your environment, your comfortable environment and your, your technology and then suddenly everything falls flat. What are you going to do? How can you have a song service without microphones? How can you have a song service without a bass guitar? How can you have a song service without any musical instruments? Well, what's going to create the atmosphere? <laughs> well, that's what we've become today, saints. Demonology has them trapped into comforts and love for pleasures instead of love for the word. That's truth. There once was a time you could just get together and put a tape on and just play. Don't even sing. Don't even do anything. Just put the tape on and we we'll all be sitting at the edge of our seats listening to the word of God and loving every minute of it. Now, no, we've got to have entertainment. We've had the wool pulled over our eyes, saints. Okay, let's have a look at the effects of progress on the church. Paragraph 98, God of the Civil Age. The prophet says, oh, look at him today. God is a good God. He's, he's saying what preachers say in the churches. God is a good God. You're in his holy church. Why? You cannot die. <laughs> Brother Bam said, but God said you would. And that settles it. See him today. In other words, the, the enemy speaking in the churches, oh, just belong to church. It ain't what you do or this, that or the other. Just come to church and be a good member. Cutting your hair, that's nonsense. Wearing shorts, put on paint, going to dances. A little beer once in a while won't hurt you as long as you don't indulge in it. Frankly, I wish you children would take it so that they would you'll learn whether they like it or not. You know, let them have a little bit of that liberal stuff, right? That's what he means. You know, this was in the time of uh, Laodicea. This was in the 1960s. Uh, and today, I mean, we're almost 50, we were 50 years past that, right? The prophet's saying, there he is, the God of this age, this evil age. Paragraph 99, I love this. He says, God is a good God. I've heard that so much till I get sick, the prophet says. God is also a God of justice. He ain't an old dotty grandpa that can be pushed around and his grandkids don't have any sin. He's a God of justice and holiness. He proved it in the Garden of Eden by his first children. You cross that line of one of his words, you're dead. Same thing applies today. Since giving man the ability to reason and the pride to be intellectual, he has been able to deceive man into thinking that God can be understood. The way you understand. Predicted and manipulated. You think God can be predicted and manipulated? Right? It's incredible. You know, progress and advancements in science lead to liberalism in the church. What is liberalism? Feeling you have the freedom to do anything you want to do. Break the laws of God. Break the standards. Do whatever you feel like. We find ourselves bending our beliefs, changing the ways we express ourselves just to accommodate advancements in science and technology. You know, I was laughing inside because we find ourselves making excuses like the prophet mentions here. You know, once we get into this advancement in science and technology, we start to say these, these things, God is a good God, right? We get into that God is a good God mentality. We've got to do that because we're not preaching what we're supposed to be preaching. So we have to tell the people God is a good God is accepting you the way you are. You know, 
I was so pleased to read this many years ago because it's how I felt. And I've been mocking this mentality of all my ministry since then. God is a good God. <laughs> God is good. <laughs> all the time. Right? After that song. No, I don't have a problem with that song. It, except that it's not entirely true. God is not good all the time. Just tramp his toes. You'll figure that out. That weird sort of mentality that God is good when you have wealth and money. Making you so comfortable till you, to, uh, to, to see how the enemy is coming in. Right? You're too comfortable to see how the enemy is coming. Why? You've got all this wealth and, 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 and money. Buying this, setting you up, you're living in plush conditions. All the technology is so wonderful, you're enjoying the word, but it's watered down and you don't care. It's because God is good. The singing is great. We sing songs to make us cry one day. Then we got entertainment and songs to make us feel happy the next. Oh, it's so wonderful. God is so good, saints. I like that. God is good. I heard that so much till I get sick. And that's, I tell you, that's exactly how I feel, saints. When I hear that, that stuff going on, it makes me sick inside. S since giving man the ability to reason, I've got to go back to that point. Because we get this education, we, we were so highly advanced, we've... You know, God took us from the sheep coat. And now suddenly we, we're something in society. So we think we understand God. We think we can predict Him. We think we can manipulate His word. How do we get to that spot where once we so feared not to add or take away, we, we once so feared not to step out of line. Now we can answer for Him. We can shout out, Thus saith the Lord, I'm telling you this, brother. God is going to do this. God showed me that and this is what's going to happen. I get terrified when I hear people saying stuff like that. I know they they don't even have a tuppence of the word inside of them, but they say they're speaking by the Holy Spirit and God showed them this and God showed them that. And they don't even they're not even keeping in touch with the revelation of the word for this day. It's tragic. I hear something. Paragraph 100, God of this evil age. He says, and notice, he preached that kind of scientific, social, educated, progressive gospel to Eve. And Adam's bride believed it. And he has succeeded in filling the so-called bride of Christ, the church of the second Adam, with the same arguments. That's right. Oh, it's not, it's not for God. God is too good to do it. Why, as long as you go to church, if thou believest... The prophet screams out, the devil believes, not make believes, but he actually believes. He's not saved. If thou believest, huh? See, saints, it's not enough to just say you believe in Jesus. You believe in God. You believe in Calvary. You believe in the blood. It isn't enough to say you believe in the message. Even the devils believed and knew that Jesus was the son of God. And the devils were not saved. Believing in your mind is only claiming that you have mental knowledge of something. But actually believing something is when it takes root in your soul and produces a love for him that affects the way you see the world and governs your thirst for all things. Amen. We must go all the way with the word. Here's a real beautiful quote. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. 1962. <clears throat> the prophet says, Now, I'm, I'm, in, I'm finite. He, that is God, he's infinite. So he cannot make a mistake. I can. You can. Our brethren can. We can all make mistakes. We're finite. Today, if I don't know more than I did last year, I'm not progressing any. But God cannot progress because he's perfect to begin with. And every decision is perfect. I love that. God cannot progress. This is one of the most profound statements of the prophet. I would never have contemplated it had he not said it. God is not in progress. 
He does not keep improving. How can God improve? He always remains the same and He knows all things. He's got nothing to improve on. This statement we know is backed up by Hebrews 13.8. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today and forever. God does not need to improve a progress, saints. It is fallen man that needs God to improve himself. In other words, we need God, we need the word to, to improve ourselves. But Satan, of course, provided a different way. He's provided other means to show you that you can progress. Like if you go to churches. You know, I, I got to say this. You don't need any single church intervention. You don't need prayer. You don't need fasting. You don't need communion. You don't need hands laid on you. You don't need any single tradition of the church to progress in God's word. You don't. All you need is faith and love in God's word. That's all. All those other things are because we are weak. That's why we need prophecies and, you know, uh, laying on of hands, prayers, fasting. That, that's the reason we need all that because we're so weak. But if you had faith in the word, now, what I'm telling you now is exactly what the prophet says in many different places, right? Man has to progress. Satan has to progress. God does not need to progress. If you just take God at his word every single day, you don't need anything else of the church. No traditions. Guarantee. And I believe that's the reason why God has moved us in this way. Imagine we've been stuck at home in a pandemic lockdown for over a year and a half. And we have not backslidden. We have not lost faith in God. While so many have. So many feel that if they don't get back to church, they're going to be lost. They're going to lose their faith. We've literally had a time where we've had nothing else to depend on but the word. It's been an incredible journey. So... We can never progress spiritually if we use God's word to expect progress in this world. That's what I'm saying. If you think you can use the message to make your life in the world easier, you are never going to progress spiritually. If we want to progress in God's word, we must be willing to put his word before all progress related to science, which is knowledge. If God blesses us with earthly blessings, we must still be willing to lose it. Right? So, all your advancements, all your entertainment, all your progress that you have in this life, you must be willing to lose it. You must be willing that if some bad thing happens, some you lose your job, you get retrenched, you get burgled, Stuff gets stolen. Your car gets hijacked. You must be living with if it's taken away from you. You must be willing to lose it. You must be willing to let it go and say, I don't care about it. Yes, I lost money. Yes, I lost this and that. But God's word comes first. That's what we ought to be thinking, saints. All right. The church trying to progress by man's achievements in science. Now we get to a few more important things before we close it down. Paragraph 153. The church has become in these days, which with its achievement, like all other man-made achievements, become scientific. The church, that right? They're trying to make a scientific church by the attraction of pictures and great steeples. And it's too bad that the Pentecostal got into that rut. You'd better... You're better off with a tamarind down in the corner and the spirit of God around you. But you're trying to compare with the rest of them because you denominated. Look who he's talking to. It's talking to us. We're trying to be like the Pentecostals. We're trying to compare with the rest of them. We're trying to get churches like them. We're trying to be like them. We're trying to have moves like they have. We're trying to have worship services like them. He says, because you denominated. 
That's what did it. See, churches are trying to be scientifically. And remember, as man achieves progress by science, he's killing himself every day. We're going to speak about that just now. When he invented gunpowder, look what it done. When he invented an automobile, it killed more than the gunpowder does. Now he's got himself a hydrogen bomb. Wonder what he's going to do with that, right? And so is the church as it tries to achieve by science, man-made scheme. It's taking you further away from God and into death more than it was at the first place. That's right. So when he says a church is trying to be scientifically, what does he mean? It's not just that they are trying to become more high tech. It's that the mindset of the leadership and the people are being consumed with less important things. They are being distracted by their science and they are losing the love of the word. Isn't that exactly what demonology wants to do? Distract you from your purpose? Not just that. Becoming obsessed with progress and men's advancement make you so bold, you start killing yourself and you don't know it. Right? That's what man is doing. He's achieving progress by science, the prophet says. He's killing himself every day. He creates the gun. He shoots himself with a gun. He creates a car. The car kills more than the gun. Then now he makes a hydrogen bomb. I mean, come on. Right? This is common sense. How many more things have we gone past the 1965s, <laughs> uh, the 1960s today? I mean, what have we created that doesn't kill us? Right? That's exactly what demonology wants. To distract you from your purpose. Not just becoming obsessed with progress. Right? We're killing ourselves by the progress. As man is doing it to the world, growing in such massive advancement and progress, and yet the world is dying and becoming, uh, and, and the world is teetering on the edge of war and destruction. We, we created the United Nations. We created World Health, World Health Organization. We created this summit and that summit meeting together. We peace talks, peace treaties. How much have we done? We've connected everyone via the internet, making sure everyone understands good constitutions, democracy. And now we're on the edge of war and destruction. Our progress and science cannot save us. And yet we just keep going. We just keep going and doing all what they tell us to do. It's as if we're so blind, we, we don't know what else we can do. It looks, it's as if we have no other ideas. And we just keep believing these politicians and leaders telling us that this is what we have to do to have peace. But is it bringing peace? Almost every country is, in a, is having its own civil war at the moment. The prophet makes that statement to point out that if that's what's happening in the world, then the same outcome awaits the church that falls into the trap of demonology in science and progress. What will happen when we put progress and science ahead of the word? We'll have polished music and singing. It'll be more about making the recording sound really great. Practicing so that we don't make the mistakes. So that the recording is fantastic and we can have more hits on YouTube. And, you know, and that's what our items and singing is about. Our congregational singing, it's about that perfection. Right? Fantastic recordings, videos of sermons, live streaming, taking care of international audience and interests more than the local church spiritual needs. Streaming is such a trap, saints, if we don't have the revealed word. Because you know you're speaking to an international audience, you can get trapped into caring about the optics, in other words, what you look like, and saying, and, and also what you're saying, watered down things like, God is a good God. Amen. And tend to stay away from the deep things because you don't want to offend anybody. Right? We can't talk about the seventh seal on streaming. We can't talk about the third pole and thunders. What do those people think of us? We can't talk about those deep things. It's going to make our friends go away. And those people don't know we believe in that. How can we say that on YouTube? <laughs> well, that's where we are with our streaming. What happens? What's the effects? The church will start growing cold, 
fellowship around the revealed word will, will decrease. All they will care about is keeping the image of the church and functioning in perfect efficiency. Family units will start to break down. Youth will begin to backslide. If it's a large church, there will be splits and breakaways. They may go years under the illusion that things are okay. And then, suddenly they will look around and see that the church is filled with really old disgruntled people who have become too lazy to do any work. They want entertainment and the young people have all backslidden or they've not kept their lives well enough to continue the ministry as it should. That's where we end. Let's look at the enemy's lie of progress. This is absolutely stunning, saints. Laodicean Church Age message, uh, Church Age book, chapter 9, page 345, paragraph 3. God says this church of the Laodicea age is wretched. That word comes from two Greek words which mean endure and trial. It has nothing to do with the trials that come to a true Christian. For God describes a Christian in trial as blessed. And his attitude one of joy. Whereas this deception is phrased as wretched and miserable. How strange. In this age of plenty, in this age of progress, in this age of abundance, how can there be trial? So what is the prophet saying here? He's talking about Laodicea and he says they are wretched and miserable. He's saying that doesn't mean they are in trials. Right? Because he says, when God looks at a Christian in a trial, he's described as blessed. And the Christian in a trial, his attitude is one of joy. He says, why are these people in Laodicea wretched and miserable? And he said, how strange. In this age of plenty, they've got plenty of food, plenty of progress, abundance of everything. How can there be trials when everything's good for you right now? But Abraham says, let's read on. Well, now it is strange. But in this age of plenty and opportunity when everyone has so much and there is so much more to be had, what will all the inventions to do our work and so many things to give us pleasure? Suddenly we find mental illness taking such a toll as to alarm the nation. When everyone ought to be happy with really nothing to be unhappy about, millions are taking sedatives at night, pet pills in the morning, rushing to doctors, entering situations and trying to drown out unknown fears by alcohol. Yes, this age boasts of its tremendous stores of wealthy goods, but the people are less happy than ever. This age boasts of its spiritual attainments, but the people are less sure of themselves than ever. This age boasts of better moral values, and it is more corrupt than any age since the flood. It talks about its knowledge and science, but it's fighting a losing battle in all fields. For the human mind and soul and the spirit cannot comprehend or keep abreast with all the changes that have come upon the earth. In one generation, we have gone all the way from horse and buggy age to the space age. And we are proud and boastful about it. But inside is a dark void cavern that is crying out in torment and without a known reason Men's hearts are failing for fear, and the world is so darkened that this age could be well called the age of neurotics. It boasts, but it cannot back it up. It cries peace, and there is no peace. It cries that it has great amplitude of all things, but it keeps burning with desire like an unsatisfied fire. There is no peace, saith my God to the wicked. This is just incredibly true, saints. No matter how much science has done for us to make life better, the world is getting worse. More serious wars are brewing. The elite of the world are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. Economies are unstable. Resources are in danger. Governments are losing control. Sickness is taking more lives. Medicine is causing more harm. We are being killed by our inventions. There is so much more entertainment, but so much more anxiety and depression. There is so much more drug dependency and less healthy people. So much more good opportunities and less happiness and contentment. You know, at one time they were fighting for more opportunities. Now there's so many opportunities and less happiness and contentment. Everyone is addicted to unending 
progress. Nobody reaches a stage that says, I have reached my peak, it's time to rest and do God's work. No. We got to work, work, work. Play, play, play. Reach one goal and see what we can start the next day or year. Just empty vessels never being filled. It's tragic. It's amazing, saints. What a statement. We have all this advancement and still not even becoming a happier public, a happier society. If we could only transfer that mentality to the love of God, that work, work, work for the love of God, if we could just do that. Let's read our last quote from Testimony of a True Witness, paragraph 265. I love this quote. Brother Barham says, I pray that you will have no rest, no rest at all, until you have received the Holy Ghost. I pray for myself and for those who raise their hands that has the Holy Ghost. I profess it, you profess it, but Christian friends, we're letting that Holy Spirit lay dormant. We are catered too much to the, the pleasures of life. We're afraid of a little affliction. We're afraid of these things. Let's lay this world aside. Hold to Him. May we as Christians who claim the Holy Spirit, may we be so ashamed of ourselves. May we be so vexed in our spirit that we'll never cease until we're living, burning lights filled with the Spirit and letting Him operate through us. I don't mean in a bunch of fanaticism. You know better than that. I mean in a true reverent way of God, through the baptism of the Spirit, through the power and manifestation, to work in this last days when we know that the end is nigh. Saints, we cannot come this far and allow earthly blessings, technology and science to hinder us. Give no thought for tomorrow. Live for the word today. Count all your gain, your progress as loss and all your loss as gain or progress for the glory of God. The desire to further oneself in this world by knowledge is in every single man today. What shall we do? Philippians 3, 7 and verse 8. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ? Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and to count them but dung that I may win Christ. Saints, we've turned this technology around in the last two years and made ourselves busy with the work of the Lord. And that's been great in this lockdown. It's amazing. We took the technology. We made it work for us. We used it to become busy with God's work. We can do this. Right? We can do this. We can, instead of wasting our time on other things, and letting our spirits slip away with this demonology in this. He is the God of this evil age. And we're letting Him control us through this technology and science. We're letting Him play with us. We're playing with Him. We did the right thing with our church in this last year. I've got to say it. It's, isn't it amazing? There were some of you brothers who could barely speak could barely pray in church in 2019. Some of you brothers could be too shy to share the word. Now I listen to you doing family altars and devotions and you're so confident. Your voices, our sisters are asking questions, fellowshipping. Isn't it amazing that you've been liberated from that that person who couldn't couldn't say anything, now you're sharing the word of God with people you work with, people you school with. Now you've got this. Why did this happen? Because we took the technology and we turned it around for us to use for God's purpose. But what's the greatest thing? We're keeping the revelation of the word as far more important than the advancements. That's the main thing. What's guiding us? The open book is guiding us. The revelation of the day is guiding us. We don't care about the time or how long the sermon is or how long the teaching is. We want more. We want more of God's word. We want him to speak to us. 
We are so in love with him. We are so in love with his word. There's nothing that excites us more. Glory to God. But saints, it's not going to last forever. We can't stay this way. We have to make sure this doesn't make us complacent. The fact that we're working at home, online, on the internet, googling this and that. We have to keep the fellowship of the word. And I get worried. When I see the fellowship start to cool down in the church, I always um, send a message to the brothers and the brothers fellowship or the deacons or someone. And I say to them, brothers, we got to get the fellowship going up. Because I just know when, when people start to get quiet, you've already started backsliding. When you stop sharing what you're reading every day, if you, if you stop sharing, if you're not sharing a quote or a scripture, if you're not doing that, it's already a sign that you are backsliding. Because it's a sign. You don't want prophecies. You don't need prophecies. You don't need dreams and visions and all that. Believe me, you don't need it. You just need to watch your fellowship groups and see that the, when disinterest starts to show itself, you know people are getting cold. And that's a, that's a sign that, that something needs to pick up. And usually the ministry has to pick that and start to do things, start to engage the people. So I encourage you, let's not let this technology and advancement of science slow us down. Let's pick up the speed. We have to keep the fellowship of the word and the love of God alive or else we'll die. Because that's what technology and science has done from before the flood. If we fall into that trap of demonology in this time under the God of this evil age, we will find ourselves dying from our purpose. We will find ourselves becoming people who have something void, something missing in our souls. We'll never have that lit up face of the love of God being shed abroad in our hearts. Let's get to work, saints. Let's not become complacent and lazy. Let's not let science and progress of this world distract us from our real purpose. May the Lord bless you, saints. It's been wonderful sharing the word of God with you. Until the next time, pray for us as we pray for you. God bless you. Amen.